You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to Treasures in Heaven. From all of us at WCAT Radio, we're glad you're with us. I am your host, Dr. William Ailes. Tonight, listening to our Lord. A prophecy given about the Son of God stated, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Our Lord handed us profound wisdom in various forms, including commands and parables. Enjoy listening to his words. Our Lord shed light on what it means to follow him in unmistakable terms. A command, for example, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Unmistakable terms. We have the love of God and the Holy Spirit that we have been baptized with, and Christ is asking us to live that way, to live the love that we have been given. It is a command, and it's a command that we can enjoy carrying out, to love one another. Our Lord also simplified deep spiritual truths in relatable stories, parables, that are fairly easy to understand, and Christ used the material world to express spiritual truths. He taught in parables shedding light on what it means to follow him with the moral of the story. So we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him. So he got into a boat and sat there, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. Picture the scene. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they had not much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell upon thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of of heaven and of course we could put our names in that sentence to us it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given we're going to find out why so teaching in parables you know a misunderstanding is that christ told parables simple stories in order that the common man could understand what he's referring to It wasn't necessarily the case. He said to the disciples, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to him who has will be given more, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand. With them, indeed, is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, You shall indeed hear, but never understand. You shall indeed see, but never perceive. Why? For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are heavy of hearing, and their eyes they have closed 
lest they should perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn for me to heal them. Obviously, the positive part of this is the disciples have been given the keys of understanding. Likewise, us. The reason is we don't have a heart that's grown dull. We have not closed our eyes. We don't have ears that cannot hear. The reason is we have bent our knee to the Son of God, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We have reached out to him so that we can perceive with our eyes and hear with our ears and understand with our hearts, for we have turned to him, and he has healed us, and he continues to heal us. I personally can testify to that. Christ then says in verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. We, 20 centuries later, have this astounding opportunity to look back in time and to read the words of the greatest prophet, the greatest man of wisdom this world has ever known. Because he was a living word of the living God in the flesh. Who else would we want to give heed to? So we are in the category of perceiving, hearing, and understanding. Why? Because we have turned to him. Our hearts have not grown dull. Our eyes are not closed. We are blessed because we see and we hear and we understand the words of our Lord. The record continues. Verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the delight of and riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is he who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. That's us. We are the good soil in God's field. The word of God planted in us that bears fruit in our lives as we live love, joy, peace, and the fruit in the lives of others who we interact with, who benefit because we seek to live the love of Christ. We are the good soil of the world. Let us yield whatever our DNA allows us to yield. Bending our knee to our Lord and Savior and devoting our heart and mind and strength to him. Verse 24, another parable he put before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, Did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? 
He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, then do you want us to go out and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. The record continues. Another parable he put before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. All this Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. We are the beneficiaries of understanding what Jesus Christ unfolded in his earthly ministry and certainly after he ascended to the right hand of God when he gave revelation to the apostles. You can never underestimate the power of the words of Jesus Christ. Verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed means the sons of the kingdom. That's us. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers and throw them into the furnace of fire There men will weep and gnash their teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Clearly, our destiny is one to shine like the sun in the kingdom of our father, the father of the Lord and Savior that we have, thank God. This is our hope. We get to live the love of Christ, to live the wisdom of Christ in this life as spiritual pilgrims in a foreign land, as ambassadors for Christ, and then at the end of the age, we will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. Thank God. The record continues, Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What we see is joy, and behind that joy is passion. He sold all that he had to partake in the kingdom of heaven, the treasure. It's like hidden in a field. It's there. And we have the opportunity to find it. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is our top priority. All else pales in insignificance. Like the Apostle Paul said, all the learning he had and the training he had in his Old Testament ways, Paul counted as worthless compared to the knowledge and the glory of Jesus Christ. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net which was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into vessels, but threw away the bad. 
So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. Verse 51, Christ asks his disciples, Have you understood all this? They said to him, Yes. And here comes another very important element in following our Lord and Savior. Passion is central. Love is central. Out of a joyful heart, central. And here comes the big punchline. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there and coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. So that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. Imagine these are his own countrymen taking offense because they saw Jesus as the carpenter's son. They knew of the works. They could hear the wisdom. But what did they see? A carpenter's son. And they took offense at him. Like, in other words, who does he think he is? He's just a carpenter's son, right? No. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. In other words, a prophet will have honor except in his own country, except with his own countrymen and his own household. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Jesus Christ certainly had the power to do mighty works, but this declaration is shocking. He did not do many mighty works there in his own country because of their unbelief. Walking with our Lord, joy, passion, love, and belief. Be it unto me according to thy will. Not my will, but thine, my Lord, be done. We just have this implicit trust in our Lord and Savior, in the words he spoke, and we believe. Let let us allow him to do mighty works among us by our belief. Not the carpenter's son. He's the anointed one prophesied from Moses to Malachi. He is the son of God. What we see is Christianity is not about checking boxes. You know, we, we, we do something, we check a box, we're done. We go to church, we show up on time, we leave, we check out, we're done. That's not what Christ is looking for. He's looking for 24-7, heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's who we are. It's not just something we do on a Sunday morning or a Saturday afternoon. It's who we are seven days a week. Our love, our passion, our joy, and our beliefs. And our lives and our words and our actions lining up with that. I'd much rather serve that type of God than a God who just wants me to punch in and punch out. This is what our Lord is interested in. In the Sermon on the Mount, he set forth some astonishingly profound truths about our personal agendas, who we are. Seeing the crowds, Matthew 5, verse 2, verse 1, he went up on a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
We'll stop there at verse 6. Recall the people whose eyes were closed, whose heart had waxed gross, ears couldn't hear. They had a different agenda. What's our agenda? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is what Christ is interested in, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Not in a moment of time, but that's who we are. That's what we live. Blessed are the meek, the humble. We bend our knee to our Lord and Savior, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's a promise from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's plenty of mourning to go around on planet Earth, but the promise is they shall be comforted. It continues, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, no double standards, no hypocrisy, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we're in good company. Those who represent the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Father God, stretching back to the prophets of the Old Testament who were also persecuted, who represented God. Christ says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Another promise from our Lord and Savior. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltness be restored? You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We individually decide what that means in our lives. We are the light of the world because we have the light of Christ in us. We are the ones who recognize he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. We are the ones who made him our Lord. We are the ones who believe in the resurrection of the dead, that he rose from the dead because he lived a sinless life and death could not keep its hold on him. We believe he ascended to the right hand of God and we know we've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to let our light shine? We make that decision before our Lord and Savior in our own individual lives, where we are at the workplace, where we are with our friends, where we are with our family. What does it mean for our light to so shine before men? But they may see our good works. So, As Christ unfolded these profound truths in the parables we heard earlier, these grand statements, cause and effect, and who we are, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, it's a relationship we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that deepens and grows stronger. That root of the word of God just goes deeper in our hearts. Nothing can shake us. That's a great place to be in life, to have that foundation, to stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He's the cornerstone of the living temple that we all are a part of. Sometimes we just need to take a look at who we are, keep things in perspective, You turn on the news at night, good Lord, it's just so bad, so negative. But we're not here. We're not called to curse the darkness. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We have a very different mission in life. Thank God for that. Luke, 
Chapter 7. Listening to the words of our Lord and Savior. Verse 28. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When they heard this, all the people, the tax collectors, justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. In other words, the commoners and the tax collectors believed John the Baptist and were baptized of him. But in contrast, the Pharisees, the temple authorities, and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him, by John. Parallels to what we saw or heard earlier. With their eyes they cannot see, with their ears they cannot hear, their heart has waxed gross. Well, we're looking at it. We have John the Baptist in the wilderness baptizing, paving the way for the Son of God. Everyone has an opportunity to make a decision. The people, the tax collectors, who are the hated people, basically bent their knee to God and were baptized of John. Not so with the Pharisees, the temple authorities, and the lawyers. They had a different agenda. And we do know in another place in Scripture, it says that they were lovers of money. Very different agenda. You cannot love money and love God at the same time. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's our agenda. Verse 31. Listen to Christ. To what then shall I compare the men of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We piped to you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not weep. In other words, we piped to you so that you could have the joy of responding and dance. You didn't participate. We wailed, and you did not weep. In other words, you couldn't be interested. You couldn't be any less interested in our sorrow. You couldn't be any less interested in our joy. No matter what we bring to you, you're not interested. The Pharisees and lawyers were not interested in John the Baptist or, obviously, Jesus Christ. They had a different agenda. They were big on judgment because they saw themselves as righteous, self-righteous, and, of course, everybody else wasn't. Verse 33, here it is. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. Verse 34, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, behold, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, the same people who were baptized of John the Baptist. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. In other words, the effects determine the cause It's wisdom to be justified. It's wisdom to be baptized by John the Baptist in that context. There's no wisdom to accuse John the Baptist of having a demon or the son of man being a glutton and a drunkard. So judgment is not what we're about. We have these tremendous examples in the Gospels of what it means to get it right and what it means to get it very wrong. We have this brain. We have a heart. Our Lord, our God, gave us free will. There they were, looking at John the Baptist. The Pharisees and lawyers thumbed their noses, but the sinners and the tax collectors went into the water and were baptized of John. They repented. That's what God is all about. For us to repent and to live righteously, not checking boxes, punching in and punching out. The record continues, verse 36. 
One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was, of course, a sinner, when she learned that he was sitting at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. How did the Pharisee who invited him respond? Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who was touching him, for she is a sinner. A lot of judgment there. And Jesus answering and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, what is it, teacher? A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, to whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. What is our Lord and Savior looking for in us? Love much. But he has, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Whoa. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Two examples. The Pharisee did not offer the Eastern hospitality to Jesus. Why not? Because of judgment. This woman, the sinner, lavished him with Eastern custom. She loved much. Your faith has saved you Go in peace. The Pharisee, a self-righteous judge, has a very different fate. Matthew 21. Here we go again. Context of temple authorities and John the Baptist. Matthew 21, verse 23. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests, And the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you a question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it? from heaven or from men? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he'll say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the multitude. For all hold that John was a prophet. Imagine this conversation among the temple authorities. Is their interest hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Absolutely not. They have a very different agenda. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. Of course, they're lying to him because they rejected John. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus continues, 
But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in my vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the harlots believed him, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward repent and believe him. Jesus Christ hit them right between the eyes. They didn't believe John. They lied to him, we do not know. They didn't believe that John the Baptist was a prophet. He came to them in the way of righteousness. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be satisfied. Who was hungering and thirsting after righteousness? The tax collectors and the harlots the classic sinners. What's God after? Exactly that. No interest in the show, the pomp, the circumstance, punching in and out. That's not what Christianity is all about. This is the words of our Lord and Savior, repenting. When we do wrong, we repent. We confess. Underneath it all, the the strength of who we are, we believe. I believe every word of this. This is all divinely inspired. This Bible that we have, especially, of course, the New Testament. How could the mind of man possibly conceive of such a presentation? It's not possible. Jesus Christ revealed to us what was hidden from before the foundation of the world and continued to do so from the right hand of God. That's our Lord and Savior. Thank God. So, when we look at these parables, eyes that can see, the disciples. Eyes that can't see, those who have a different agenda. Ears that can't hear, ears that can hear. Different agenda. Heart has waxed gross. We are all about love. We are all about believing. We're all about seeking after righteousness. We are all about repenting. It becomes second nature. The spiritual nature within us becomes who we truly are. You know, we let go of that fleshly nature that, you know, has us doing things that we wish we didn't do. That's basically what the flesh does to us. We think twice. You know, who are we in Christ? Lights of the world, salt of the earth. You know, we think about what we say. We think about what we do. Because we're not like everybody else. We're not standing around judging, acting self-righteously. That's not who we are. John, chapter 3, more words of our Lord. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This is a big shot. He's a temple authority. His name is Nicodemus. This man came to Jesus by night. And the reason why he came to Jesus by night is because he did not want to be seen by the other Pharisees because the Pharisees were already rejecting Jesus Christ. So he came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So the rabbi, I mean, the the Pharisee begins by talking about these signs, these miraculous signs that Jesus is doing. What does Jesus do? 
Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew or born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born anew. Of course, being born anew means having that baptism of the Holy Spirit within us. The love, the joy, the peace of God. It is being born of God. We are born of his nature. Christ continues. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. There you go. Born anew, born again, born of the Spirit, all the same thing. Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony referring to the temple authorities. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of God. So, there was already, of course, this predisposition against Jesus Christ because the Pharisees were living in their self-righteous world and their self-righteous world of judgment. And they were judging Jesus to be not who he claimed he was. But Jesus now goes back in time to Moses. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Of course, when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the followers of Moses, the Israelites, were healed. This Pharisee certainly would have known the story of Moses and the serpent in the wilderness. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. Of course, he's referring to his resurrection, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's a very good response from God for our response to believe on the Son of God. I mean, we have this free will choice to embrace the Son of God and to live as sons of God. Our end result is eternal life. Not for a moment can we ever lose track of that eternal living hope. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Thank God that was the will of the Father. He who believes in him is not condemned. Why? We're not condemned because we're judged righteous. Our sin is transferred to the cross and the righteousness of Christ is transferred to us. That's why we're not condemned. How could God condemn a righteous man? But it's not righteousness we earn, it's righteousness that God grants us. Because it doesn't say he who behaves in him, he who believes in him. Is not, con- is not condemned. We have to begin with the belief that Jesus is who he says he is. Not a mental assent, but a true heartfelt belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior of the world, the living Word of the living God in the flesh. I believe it. Absolutely. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already 
because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that light, or that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They have a different agenda. The Pharisees had a very different agenda. They loved money. Their deeds were evil. They loved darkness rather than light, and they judged Jesus not to be who he claimed he was. And, of course, they plotted against him to kill him. Verse 20, For everyone who does evil hates the light. It does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. That's us. We love the light. We want to do what is true. The hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus Christ divides very simply. He is the light of the world. By our free will choice, we can gravitate toward the light or we can walk away from the light. And Christ very simply put forth the cause behind the effect. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. That's the agenda. So in the future... When they stand before the throne of Christ, they shall be without excuse. They shall be condemned because they never went to the light because their deeds were evil. No excuses. That makes you know, our lives the light of the world because we follow the light. We do what is right, what is true. That it may be clearly seen that our deeds have been wrought in God. That's who we are. We're living this command. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, beginning with Moses, Every prophet recorded something about the coming Messiah, the Christ. And nearly 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus declared that he was the Son of God, or is the Son of God. He spoke words that were revolutionary and, frankly, still are revolutionary. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 12. And Jesus Christ brought to mankind a new agreement from the Creator that addressed the here and now and the connection with the hereafter. And that's what we just read about eternal life. That's why Christ came into the world. That's our ultimate destiny for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life Christ is the one who brought the new agreement the new covenant from the creator our God and addressed the here and now as we've been seeing in parables and examples illustrations and the connection with the hereafter in very straightforward language with Nicodemus so this story that we read about the Son of God resonates through the centuries right here to the 21st century. Truth has no time limit. Thank God for that. During the Sermon on the Mount, Christ said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Recall what we read earlier, the joy, the passion. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and all these things shall be added unto you. Notice how Christ is saying, seek the kingdom of God and seek his righteousness. We're not seeking our own righteousness. We seek his righteousness through Jesus Christ. That's how righteousness is bestowed upon us. We don't earn our righteousness in the new covenant. That's what was the case in the old covenant. Moses had said, it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all that we have been commanded. That's the old agreement. The new agreement is that we have righteousness by faith. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's seeking the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Of course, we live righteously. We're conscious of doing what's right, but it's the righteousness that God grants us through his Son. That's what Christ is saying. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, Jesus Christ blazed the trail for us to walk on, the path. Central is this word love, the new command I give you. That Greek word is agape. It's not of this earth. It's not found among secular writers of the time. It is one source, Jesus Christ. He fills us with this love when he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And he continues to love us with that love. See, we are vessels, this earthen vessel. But we are chosen vessels through which his divine love flows. All we have to do is allow ourselves to embrace this spiritual reality. This is our truth. It becomes evident that the love we give is the love of our Lord. And thus we can release the need to seek recognition for it and release the need to gain by it. When we embrace this, our spiritual walk takes on a new dimension, a new awareness of our personal bond with the Son of God. We are in this together. We have one Lord, Him. We have one King, Him. We have one head of the body, Him. We have one bridegroom, Him. We are one with him and one with his words. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ gave examples. Giving unconditional love takes many forms, but there are common threads that he gave us. Matthew 6, verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is what our Heavenly Father longs for us to be, men and women who love to live love. Not with eye pleasers, pleasing men, but with service to God and our Lord and Savior. In other words, we keep our camera crew and our publicists at home when acting selflessly and giving righteously. God will reward us. This is our life. This is our way of being. And, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, of course, this is what the show is based on, Treasures in Heaven. Do not store for yourselves treasures upon earth, but rather store for yourselves treasures in heaven. Christ makes a very important point. He's communicating not only the difference in the source of the reward, but the source of the inspiration, because he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart, which means your wishes, your desires, 
that on which your life centers will be also. Jesus Christ and the Father are all about where our heart is. And the heart literally is the seat of life. It's the starting point of our decisions and our personal developments that produce our unique distinctive character. The heart is the inner voice that directs our steps and speaks volumes about what we value. It is the center of our longing, devotion, and desire. This is what Christ is communicating in the parables. This is what he's communicating in the contrast between the Pharisees and the sinners. This is what he's communicating to us in the Sermon on the Mount. He's interested in our hearts. From out of a pure heart pouring forth, all that Christ is, the love, the joy, the peace. What we choose to store in our heart becomes evident now and for eternity. Proverbs says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And to keep means to guard, protect, and maintain. See, we create this internal atmosphere and this inner dialogue in our heart by guarding, protecting, and maintaining eternal divine truths like what we saw in the parables, like what we saw in the exchanges with Christ and Nicodemus, with Christ and the Pharisees, the woman who brought the oil and ointment and anointed feet of Jesus Christ and cleaned his feet. These stories, these examples... in our hearts this inner dialogue creates what is outside of us storing up treasures in heaven is a journey through which we see god and his glory in the divine light in which jesus presented him jesus christ said he who has seen me has seen the father when he speaks he presents the heart of our creator jesus was god's gift to us He loved the unlovable. He ate with sinners and gave up his life for us. We know intuitively that his love is the most endearing love. It's love without conditions. We see this in an example he gave us. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. That's our lives. That's storing up treasures. It's just acts of righteousness and compassion that become who we are. Simple, absolutely. But it's not just simple, it's fundamental to the kingdom of Christ, to who we are as a people. Jesus focused on walking in the light, drew a contrast between finite human love, which seeks a reward on earth, and infinite divine love, which does not seek a reward on earth. In essence, it's the difference between human vanity and human valor. God and his son set the stage and gave us our storyline. Be free of the world's ways. Be free of the thoughts that separate us from the mind of Christ. Let's be wholly dedicated to elevating our will to his will. That's what Christ is interested in. So we listen to the Son of God. He opened his mouth in parables, and he uttered what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. He handed us profound wisdom in various forms. It is a joy to listen to him speak, to him interacting, to him cutting right to the chase, cutting right to the heart, and telling us, the truth. At the end of the day, that's what I'm interested in, the truth. Now close in prayer. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you from all of us at WCAT Radio. Good night.
WCATradio.com has a show for every interest. Apologetics, theology, moral living, and more. Know your faith. Please look up my show, Know Your Faith, by logging into WCATradio.com. Then click on Fridays, and that's where you'll find me. Know Your Faith, a show hosted by me, Robert Madrigal, and we'll see you at the show. For listening to a production of WCAT Radio, please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.